Think Forward. Think Research Channel. I am part of the Department of Otolaryngology at the Medical Center here. And otolaryngology is this just fancy word for ear, nose, and throat. And my area of interest and the focus of my practice is sinus surgery and diseases of the nose and the sinuses. Um, so I am grateful to all of you for braving the blustery weather and I hope uh, that you'll gain some new information in this field that um, is really far reaching um, as you'll see uh, millions of people in this country suffer from uh, sinus problems and it's really an evolving area of research and treatment. So I'd like to uh, share with you tonight uh, some of the current knowledge and some of the directions that we hope to take this field. So just first a little bit about the impact of acute and chronic sinus infections on our society. Uh, there are 20 million cases of sinusitis diagnosed annually. So that's a tremendous uh, number of sick uh, Americans uh, due to this particular problem. And it's the fifth most common diagnosis for which antibiotics are prescribed. So this is really a significant expense as well to our society. Over $3 billion a year spent on medical expenses for sinusitis. And this does not include other what we call indirect expenses such as lost work, um, and wages that are lost due to uh, illness. So more than billions of dollars. And so you can see this is a very significant diagnosis. And uh, lastly, uh, if you or anyone that you know suffers from sinusitis, you will understand the impact that this diagnosis has on quality of life. Um, recently, we've been able to develop uh, some good instruments, scientific instruments to measure quality of life. And it's very surprising that uh, chronic sinus infections actually cause as much disability or perhaps more than certain diagnoses such as diabetes and congestive heart failure in terms of social disruption, uh, in terms of the level of energy. And this is a very surprising finding, but I think that it resonates with a lot of our patients who do come in who suffer from chronic sinusitis. So just a little bit about the anatomy. This is not going to be um, a medical school level talk, but I am going to use a fair bit of terminology um, because I think it's important for you to get a better understanding about what's going on in your sinuses because for many people it's just a black box. You know that you have an infection, but you don't really understand what is actually going on deep within. So I'd like to share with you a little bit of uh, some of the basic anatomy. Uh, there are four sinuses uh, on each side, and these are typically air-filled and paired. They're located between the eyes and uh, in the forehead and below, uh, and below the brain. Now, sinuses are lined with cilia, and cilia uh, are hair cells that sweep mucus along. So there's actually a hygiene function to the lining of the sinus, and when these cilia don't work well, that's when we start to have problems. So if you can't sweep the mucus out, either because the cilia aren't working well or because there's a blockage of the sinus, that's the setup for a sinus infection. And the openings to the sinuses are very small, two to four millimeters in diameter. So we're talking about a very finely tuned system that if there are significant disruptions to either ciliary function or perhaps blockage of that very small opening, that's gonna to lead to sinus problems. We don't really know why we have sinuses, uh, but there are some interesting theories. One of the theories is that uh, the sinuses lighten the head. So if you think about a bird's skull, it's mostly air. And so by having these air-filled chambers within our head, uh, this does serve to lighten the skull. Another function that uh, we think the sinuses serve is to uh, resonate the voice. So if you think about a guitar, 
it's hollow and it allows the projection of that sound. If you were to fill that guitar with concrete or dirt, the sound really wouldn't project very far because it doesn't have that air chamber to uh, vibrate the sound to project. So we do think that the sinuses allow us to project our voice. And the last uh, consideration is that the sinuses may serve as kind of an airbag for the very critical structures that they surround, the brain and the eyes. So for example, if you were to take a direct hit to your eye socket, rather than having a, a direct rupture of your eyeball, what would happen is that force would be absorbed by the sinuses and you would get a small fracture of the thin bony wall and that would actually absorb the force to protect the eyes. So this may be a third function. Um, this is a cross-sectional view of the head showing three of the four sinuses and uh, what I want to show you here is just the different ones and their names. So the frontal sinus is the one in the forehead. So this is the eye socket here and this would be the brain up here. And then the ethmoid sinus is the one that's between your eyes. And then the maxillary sinus is the one in your cheek. And notice the relationship between the maxillary sinus and the teeth. So people who have maxillary sinusitis may present to their dentist first, thinking that they have a dental problem. And that's because the nerves that go to the teeth are irritated and it feels just like a, uh, a dental problem. What I also want to show you here is these arrows. And what these arrows represent is the directional flow of mucus. So the cilia, these little hair cells that line that sinus, are sweeping mucus up and out through this narrow opening. And note, at least for this maxillary sinus, that the opening is at the top. And look how narrow this outflow tract is. So if there's something that obstructs that narrow opening, that sinus is not going to be able to drain those secretions. That may develop a, into a sinus infection. And then one more sinus that needs this side view to show is called the sphenoid sinus. And this sinus is the one in the very back. The sphenoid sinus is pretty much in the middle of your head. If you were to draw a line from your ear and the top of your head, where they meet would be the sphenoid sinus. There are also uh, nerves that line these sinuses, and it's these nerves that give us our sinus headaches. It's not really important to know the names of these nerves, but what is important as the physician is to know which uh, pain distributions correspond to which sinuses. So if you have uh, a maxillary sinusitis, then chances are you're going to present with pain in your cheek or maybe in your teeth, as I had mentioned. If you have an ethmoid sinusitis, you're going to be irritating these nerves here and you're going to have discomfort between your eyes or across the nasal bridge. The frontal sinus uh, would be forehead pain or pressure. And then the sphenoid sinus, uh, because it is deep in the head, it's more of a deep headache. Sometimes that presents as a headache actually at the top of the head. People say, oh, my, I feel like my head's going to, top of my head's going to blow off or deep behind the eyes, and that, that would be more of a sphenoid type of a headache. There are another set of nerves that are very important in the nose, and that is the olfactory nerves, or the nerves for the sense of smell. And if you look at the side view of the nasal cavity, these are the olfactory nerves. So here's the brain, and olfactory nerves are actually a direct extension of uh, nerve tissue coming from the brain, from the olfactory nerve, and it's sending out little branches to the top of the nose. So when you have a lot of swelling in your nose, the reason you may lose your sense of smell is because the impulses that are trying to travel up can no longer reach these very delicate olfactory nerves. So I wanted to show you what our current definition is of sinusitis. It may seem fairly obvious what a sinus infection is, but it actually took many, many years for ENT doctors to agree on what actually is sinusitis. So this is our current working definition, and that is a sinusitis is a disease process that is characterized by inflammation of the mucosa, which just means the, the mucous membrane of the nose and the sinuses, and the underlying bone of the nasal cavity and sinuses. So the emphasis here is on inflammation, and I'm going to come back to that later on in the talk. How do we diagnose this then? We have major and minor criteria, and if you've ever had a sinus infection, you'll probably agree that these are fairly accurate descriptions of what it's like to have a sinus infection. So the major criteria are the facial pain and pressure, nasal congestion or nasal fullness, uh, drainage, and purulent means like pus, so discolored yellow-green nasal discharge. And then, uh, as I mentioned with the olfactory nerves, if there's a lot of swelling in the nose, you're going to lose uh, part of your sense of smell or maybe all of your sense of smell, and that's what we call anosmia or hyposmia. So these are all the major factors. And then we have minor criteria as well, headache, bad breath, uh, fatigue, cough, and, and dental pain. 
Now, typically, if you have a fever, that's not going to represent chronic sinusitis, but we can see fever with acute sinusitis. So in order to make a diagnosis, what we want to see is two of the major criteria or one of the major criteria and two of the minor criteria. And then we will typically want to back this up with uh, some x-ray studies as well. And the time course of your symptoms would also determine what kind of sinusitis you have. So an acute sinusitis is one that would last up to four weeks. And with acute sinusitis, we expect complete resolution of that infection. And chronic sinusitis is uh, greater than 12 weeks. So if your symptoms have been going on longer than three months, you move into a different category of what we call chronic sinusitis. Now, I alluded to the fact that there are certain triggers that can narrow the sinuses and prevent their drainage and trigger infections. And it's actually like a cycle. And sometimes this can become a vicious cycle that propagates the infection. So you start out with something that causes swelling inside the nose either a virus or allergy or something else in the environment. And then that causes obstruction. Ostia means opening. So it, it causes an obstruction of that sinus opening that leads then to stagnation of that mucus. So the cilia can't push that mucus out because there's a blockage at the doorway of the sinus. Then you have a pool of mucus in a very warm environment with lots of nutrients. And that's a setup for bacteria to grow. So then the bacteria develop. And as the bacteria grow, that actually causes more swelling. So you have an in, the bacteria creating more swelling because the bacteria are growing. And this creates this cycle over and over. And we need to break the cycle somewhere along there to resolve a sinus infection. And patients with chronic sinusitis can't break out of this cycle that has uh, developed. So uh, there are multiple factors that can contribute to sinus infections. And these are just some of them. Uh, a viral cold is probably the most common predisposing factor for an acute sinusitis. Um, and so if your cold lasts longer than a couple weeks and you start to have a lot of pressure in your cheek, uh, you might want to think that, you might want to consider this as an acute sinusitis. Um, allergies do have a role in uh, the treatment or in the diagnosis and in the uh, propagation of uh, chronic sinus infections. And the genetic predisposition is very important as well. Uh, we usually take a family history in our office to ask what kinds of diseases uh, run in your family? And many, many times we hear, well, I have family members who've had sinus surgery. My father had polyps or um, a lot of allergies that run through the family. So we don't actually have a very specific test yet that can diagnose a gene for sinusitis, but I think that's the future. And what we do know, though, is that there is familial clustering of uh, tendencies, predispositions to sinusitis. And then the environmental factors, in addition to allergy, uh, can also be a factor in causing nasal swelling that can predispose to sinus infections. Um, there are also hormonal contributions. Uh, we do have patients during their pregnancy who didn't have any sinus problems before. Um, and any of you, some of you may have experienced this, where your nose just really swells up during your pregnancy. And that's because of the hormonal surges that create significant swelling in the nose. When you come to my office, uh, I'm going to want to have a good look inside your nose. And uh, these are perhaps intimidating tools, but they're actually uh, very useful for looking at the depths of your nose. And if you think about it, there are very few doctors that can get a really good look deep inside. Um, and so this is something that, as specialists, we can offer you. Um, and that is a detailed look with fiber optic uh, telescopes that get to the areas where the sinuses are draining. And that helps us to make the diagnosis of sinusitis. Um, in the primary care office, we're mostly using uh, otoscopes, uh, or uh, this is basically an otoscope for the ear that's adapted to look inside the nose. But you don't get as good of a view as if you can pass a very narrow scope deeper in to actually look at the detailed anatomy. These are some of the things we might see. Uh, some of you may have heard of a diagnosis called deviated septum. And all that means is that the wall that runs down the middle of your nose that separates it into two sides is actually pushed over more to one side. And you can see here, at, from this view from below, that the septum, which was normally straight up and down, is shifted over to the left side. And this demonstrates how that can actually narrow the uh, sinus outflow. So if you have the deviated septum that's pushed over to this side, look at how it narrows that drainage pathway of this sinus. And then nasal polyposis is something that we also see. So a nasal polyp is shown right here. It's that pale. Uh, 
blob that sits right here, and then the, the surrounding mucosa, or the surrounding mucous membrane is actually normal mucous membrane here in the nose, but this is the abnormality, and on this one, it's right here. So a nasal polyp is actually a uh, protuberance of tissue that's actually benign. It's not a tumor, uh, but it represents an outpouching of swollen tissue, and it's got a lot of fluid in it, and it blocks the sinuses, and it represents an excessive amount of inflammation in the nose. So just a little bit about acute sinusitis. I mentioned to you already that this is something that is self-limited. It should resolve after about four weeks. Most typically, it would follow a cold. And um, patients present with very severe discomfort. Uh, these are patients who normally don't have a lot of symptoms, uh, never really have a history of sinusitis. Then they get a cold, and it's very severe. Dental pain, you know, they want to go to their dentist, or severe headache. Uh, and uh, this is what we might see. We might see, again, pus, purulent discharge, draining out of the area of the sinuses. And then we might culture this uh, to make the diagnosis of an acute sinusitis. Uh, for acute sinusitis, we rarely need uh, x-rays. We do this, the diagnosis by examination and by history, unless we think that there may be a, an unusual case, such as a complication. So to treat sinusitis, we want to break that cycle that I showed you, and we can do this in a number of ways. First, we want to control the infection, so we'll give antibiotics. We want to reduce the tissue swelling with decongestants. We want to reopen that drainage pathway, and remember, it's a very small opening, so it's going to take a lot of work to open that tiny area to clear all that swelling away to let that sinus drain out again. But once we restore the opening, the cilia, which have been hampered because of the obstruction, will regain their function and will start to sweep the mucus out again. So typically we would treat an acute sinus infection with seven to 10 days of an antibiotic. And we would also use either a topical decongestant like a nasal spray or an oral decongestant. Now you have to be careful with the nasal sprays because they are addictive. And if you use them more than five days, your body will start to become dependent on them. And so we, uh, we discourage using them longer than a few days. Um, but again, acute sinusitis is self-limited, and uh, typically one visit to the doctor is all you need. Now, chronic sinusitis is a different beast altogether. And remember, these are patients that have been suffering for at least three months. And these patients um, are always having problems. Every day they know that they have a sinus infection or some, some degree of sinus problem. Now, it's not going to be severe all the time, but uh, what they're going to have is some symptoms at baseline and then they develop a frequent cycle of exacerbations of sinusitis. And these are the patients that occupy the bulk of my practice. Um, there may be temporary relief with antibiotics, uh, but typically it's sort of a very prolonged course, and I would say sort of smoldering, just always there, um, never gone away, um, but not the severe acute uh, spikes of discomfort that we see with the acute sinusitis. And in terms of the causes, I think of it as sort of a chicken and an egg, okay? And what I'm talking about here is the balance between inflammation and infection. And this is a relatively new concept in chronic sinusitis. In the past, we thought of chronic sinusitis as primarily an infectious problem, one that you might go to see an infectious disease specialist for, perhaps even before your ear, nose, and throat doctor. But this concept is changing now, and we are thinking about chronic sinusitis as primarily an inflammatory disease. Now, infection is important, and there's a distinction here, but they're related. So what we're starting to think now is that something is causing abnormal inflammation in the sinuses that's creating the swelling, and the infection is secondary to the inflammation, rather than the other way around, where we used to think that primarily you had a bad infection, and then that causes the inflammation. It's a subtle distinction, but what it really affects is the way that we approach this disease. And I'm going to review with you some of the medications that we're using, and you'll see the focus on anti-inflammatory therapies for sinusitis as really being the mainstay for chronic sinusitis. So I've divided the summary of therapies into anti-infective and anti-inflammatory. So uh, in terms of the anti-infectives, we're mostly thinking about antibiotics. And uh, most of the time, we're going to give oral antibiotics, but topicals have a, a role as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about antifungals because there has been a lot of uh, recent interest in the possible role of fungus in chronic sinusitis. So before I talk about the kinds of antibiotics I'm using, I just want to point out to you 
that uh, even though antibiotics are great and they definitely have a role, there's a downside to overuse of antibiotics, and that's demonstrated by this slide. What this slide shows you is the prevalence of streptococcus, so the typical strep, that are resistant to penicillin. And what you see here is for a couple of decades, the rate of resistance was quite low, less than 5%, maybe 10%. But look what's happened in the last 15 to 20 years, a massive escalation of resistance. So nowadays, over half of our strep isolates from our cultures are either partially resistant or totally resistant to penicillin. So this, I think, is a result of overuse of antibiotics. And I think that our patients are getting smarter. All of you are on the internet now researching this, and you're understanding the idea that it's not always good to take an antibiotic, especially if you don't have an infection. Because what that's doing is, is actually possibly promoting resistance. So this is an important concept. So what we do in our office to minimize uh, the, our role in making resistance worse in our community is doing a lot of culturing. So this is something that your ear, nose, and throat doctor can provide for you as a service to try to narrow the focus of the antibiotic treatment. So if we, if we see some pus or discolored mucus draining out of your nose, we can go in with our scopes and take a small sample of that and culture that and grow that out and figure out exactly what is the best antibiotic to treat that infection. So that helps us to uh, narrow the focus and uh, minimize the risk of developing resistance for our um, identified organisms. So we do use a lot of oral antibiotics and that is the mainstay of treatment for the infective side of chronic sinusitis. But uh, topical antibiotics actually do have a role. And many of the patients who have come to see me have been on lots of oral antibiotics. We usually ask them to write a list and you know, they've been on everyone that's been out there. So in order to try to develop a more innovative approach, one of the things that we uh, do try to use are topical antibiotics. Now topical antibiotics um, are attractive because they deliver antibiotics to, directly to the area involved. But if you haven't had surgery, it's very hard for those antibiotics to actually penetrate into the sinuses themselves. Uh, so it's mostly developed for patients who have already had surgery, who have sinuses that are open, and then we can send the antibiotic deeper into the sinuses. Um, so again, it's not as useful for unoperated patients. And uh, potentially, we can treat uh, very resistant bacteria using antibiotics that we normally wouldn't be able to give by mouth. So for example, if we had normally would have had to use an intravenous antibiotic, well, maybe we can put that into something that you can squirt in your nose and treat that infection instead of having to go on an intravenous course. And it's nice because you're not really swallowing a lot of this and it's not going into your bloodstream so we can avoid a lot of the side effects. Um, there are several ways to give topical antibiotics. We can mix up all kinds of different sprays. Um, we can put it into more of a larger volume irrigation. And then also one uh, type of uh, modality that has become recently popularized is nebulized. So a sort of a steam-like uh, delivery of uh, particles to the sinuses. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the nebulized antibiotics because it really has been all the rage in the last five years or so. Um, but looking at the data, I'm not really sure that this is the best way to send antibiotics to the sinuses. So uh, just a summary of the different types of research that have, has been done in the area of nebulized antibiotics. Uh, it, it was found that nebulized antibiotics do allow patients to enjoy a longer period of uh, being free of an infection, um, but it's not a dramatic improvement. So 17 weeks uh, versus six weeks when compared to oral antibiotics. But there's a downside to this. Um, first of all, nebulized antibiotics were shown to influence changes in the kinds of bacteria that were identified in someone's nasal passage. So there's a, a selection pressure by exposing someone to these antibiotics that is greater than oral. And so we're talking about the evolution of resistance. Well, we don't know yet because nebulized antibiotics haven't been used that long, but we need to be concerned if the bacteria are rapidly changing in response to the nebulized therapies, is this going to promote resistance down the road? Another study was very interesting in that it took nebulized saline, so just salt water alone, and compared it to nebulized salt water with an antibiotic. And what they found was that when they added the antibiotic in this blinded study, it actually didn't help patients more. So what was felt to be the thing that helped them the most was actually just having nebulized salt water through their nose.
So we're not sure, at least in this one study, whether the addition of antibiotic was actually very helpful because patients just seem to benefit from having a cleansing action of salt water in their nose. And in fact, we do use a lot of irrigations in our practice, in, um, not so much nebulized, but just large volume saline rinses. And uh, this is an area of interest for me in terms of my research, and that is looking at where exactly do these particles that are dispersed by a nebulizer go? And if you look at the most popular nebulizers on the market right now, the majority of those particles actually get sent to the lung because the particles are so small that they bypass the nose altogether. So I think before we readily adopt a very uh, attractive, in theory, uh, attractive way of delivering medications to the nose, we need to make sure that we're actually doing what we think we're doing with that device. And so we need more research to see that nebulized particles are actually getting to the nose and the sinuses, and they're actually helping us control infection. So in summary, topical antibiotics are a great idea, but we have to be concerned about the potential for development of resistance. And topical antibiotics, even though in general have a lower uh, side effect profile than oral antibiotics, there are patients who do have side effects as well, such as diarrhea and sometimes even dizziness. And in general, we just need more data. We need more research in this area to really determine what the role is of topical therapies. Just a couple slides here now on the potential role of fungus in uh, chronic sinusitis. Uh, this was a uh, much heralded study from the Mayo Clinic uh, in 1999 that uh, caused all of us to reconsider what the role of fungus was in chronic sinusitis. And they presented a large series of patients who had fungus cultured out in their nose when they had a special technique for isolating that fungus. So they found almost 100% of their chronic sinus patients uh, having fungus in their nose. So they wanted to make a very strong claim that fungus was very important. And indeed, that's a very impressive number. But the other side of the study is that when they looked at their normal subjects, 100% of those patients also had fungus in their nose. So now what do you make of this? Is fungus important or is it not? Now, what we learned from the study was that you can get fungus out of anyone's nose. And in fact, since the study, there have been some very interesting data that showed that if you looked at a newborn nursery, by four months, you're going to be able to isolate fungus in the nose of, of a baby. So fungus is everywhere. Some people are responding abnormally to it, but most of us aren't. So think about that. 100%, almost 100% 100 of people in this room are going to have fungus in your nose if you look carefully enough. So it's a little bit difficult to say now what the significance of fungus is in chronic sinusitis. And when we look at the clinical trials that are trying to deliver antifungals to help patients with chronic sinusitis, it's a very mixed picture. So the, mo the most stringent, best-designed studies, the double-blind placebo studies, have not really shown a dramatic improvement in patients who receive antifungals compared to the placebo uh, Group. So at this point, I'm not really ready to recommend antifungals to every patient with chronic sinusitis, and different specialists in our field differ in terms of their view on the significance of it. But I will say that there are some patients that do have a dramatic improvement with antifungal therapies, but it's a very small percent of my practice. And so I think it's important to think about, but again, same, uh, same line I'm going to give you. We're waiting for more research. And this just shows you that this is a, a developing field um, we've known about sinusitis for a long time, but we are just now beginning to learn about some of these mechanisms. And that's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of excitement about what's going to come out of this research in the next, uh, in the years to come. So does fungus cause chronic sinusitis? I would say definitely maybe, and that's about all we can say at this time. I, I would say that it's not first-line therapy. Um, and at least right now, the clinical data does not show that antifungal medications are definitively beneficial. So we're going to move on to now to inflammatory therapies. And, you know, this balance that I've referred to between inflammation and infection in recent years really seems to be tipping towards the inflammatory side of causes for chronic rhinosinusitis. And these are some of the major ways that we can deliver anti-inflammatory treatments to the sinuses, uh, topical nasal steroids, oral steroids, and then allergic therapies. Topical steroids are an excellent way of delivering anti-inflammatory medication to the nose. They're sprayed directly on there and they're very safe. So you're delivering 
Uh, steroid is basically an anti-inflammatory uh, medication. It's effective for allergies, nasal polyps, and just general nasal swelling. Unlike the decongestant sprays that I mentioned to you earlier, nasal steroid sprays are not addictive. And in fact, we encourage our patients to use them every day, and you're not gonna get good relief from them unless you do use them on a regular basis. Oral steroids, I call the 700-pound gorilla of anti-inflammatory agents because they are very, very effective in controlling inflammation. Uh, all of these different ways that steroids work, they decrease the role of white blood cells, which are one of the key cells in, in the inflammatory process. They curtail the activity of those cells. Um, they reduce uh, the production of inflammatory mediators called cytokines. They also reduce uh, histamine. So even for an allergic reaction, we talk, we talk about taking antihistamines and steroids, although they're not strictly an, an allergic drug, they actually do reduce the histamine reaction that is associated with allergy. And they just decrease swelling in general. Of course, that sounds great, but there's gotta be a downside, right? And of course there is. And so in the short term, if I give a patient of mine oral steroids, I'm going to counsel them about possible side effects. Otherwise, I'm gonna get a very angry phone call, maybe the next day or the day after, that why didn't you tell me about all these side effects? And if any of you have taken oral steroids, you, you may recognize some of these side effects, uh, primarily insomnia. Um, if you're a borderline diabetic, you can push up your blood sugars. It, uh, this is the one that we talk about with the spouses, irritability and mood change. Um, and so you may suddenly break out into tears and not really understand why, and it's the steroids that are doing that. Um, increased appetite and weight gain, which is not a pleasant side effect for some people. Topical steroids are safe and they're not absorbed, and so actually if you use topical steroids every day, you're not gonna get any of these. So we always try to use the topical steroids first line, and then the oral steroids for more severe cases. But the oral steroids do have a role because they're such a potent anti-inflammatory that they really do help patients. Now, if, if you're gonna be on steroids for a long time, there are more serious side effects that we need to be concerned about including osteoporosis, cataract formation, and changes to the integrity of your skin, uh, easy bruising. So we really want to avoid the use of steroids in large quantities over a long period of time because we recognize these very significant long-term side effects. Um, many of you are familiar with allergic therapies, I'm sure, because you, you may be on some of these yourself or you may know uh, associates or friends that are on these. And uh, we use some of the same drugs overlapping for allergy therapy as we do for sinusitis. Um, we may use uh, antihistamines, the nasal, topical nasal steroids, um, and then shots. The thing that I wanna just uh, emphasize to you though is that allergy is just one type of inflammation. I have many patients who are very frustrated because they go to their allergist to try to find a cause for their sinus problems and they come back completely negative. The allergy testing is completely negative and they swear they have allergies because they're sensitive to everything. But what I try to discuss with my patients is the fact that inflammation doesn't necessarily mean allergy. There's many types of inflammation and hopefully I'm showing you lots of different uh, path, potential new pathways for inflammation that we're just learning about. So just because you have negative allergy testing doesn't mean you don't have in, uh, inflammation in your nose. It just means that it's not an allergic type of inflammation and the science remains uh, to be learned as to all these other types of inflammation um, that are clinically important. So for treating chronic sinus problems, we will use the antibiotics because there is this infective component, but we're also gonna work hard to try to control that inflammation with topical steroids and oral steroids. And then if someone is very experienced and they can juggle a lot of different medications, we might add the decongestants um, and then allergic therapies, but uh, the decongestants don't really get, get to the root of the cause. They just give you symptomatic relief. They shrink the tissue a little bit, but they're not actually treating the cause of sinusitis. And so um, this is my own personal guidelines for what I would consider to be maximal therapy for, for uh, sinusitis, and that would be about a month of an of a, uh, antibiotic, usually either broad spectrum or directed specifically to a culture result. And then I would give my patients oral steroids um, because I do find that they work very synergistically with the uh, antibiotics. Uh, topical nasal steroids, I guess, I also think do have a role. And then treatment of any environmental allergies. So this is my own method, and uh, this is going to vary from doctor to doctor. But again, this is just my own personal uh, 
uh, thought process in terms of what I want to make sure a patient has experienced to know that I've given them everything that I can in terms of a medical treatment for sinus problems. If patients continue to do poorly, then this is the time that we think about getting some uh, radiologic studies. So a CAT scan is what we would use to evaluate patients with chronic sinusitis. And then if it, the patient was being seen by a primary care doctor, I think this would be an appropriate time for an ENT referral. Again, because we have a special access to view the depths of the nasal cavity that is not, just not available in the primary care doctor's office. And this is the time that we start to think about possible surgery for patients. So uh, in terms of the types of x-rays that you want to get, it's really a CAT scan that is the, the gold standard now for evaluating the sinuses. And we don't use plain films anymore at all. So I want to just talk a little bit now about sinus surgery. And uh, if I ask you what you think about when you hear the word sinus surgery, um, this may be what comes to mind. You know, black eyes, um, kind of a negative experience. Now, this is not the Stanford method of sinus surgery, OK? But uh, if you talk to people, there's a lot of hesitation about sinus surgery because in, in, in the past, the way that sinus surgery was done was fairly difficult on patients. But I'm happy to report to you that our technology has really improved our ability for patients to have a very positive experience having sinus surgery. So this is sort of the old school. Lots of packing, bruising, um, a lot of pain. Uh, the sinuses would typically get stripped out, so all that uh, sinus lining was going to get stripped out. And unfortunately, that ended up filling in with scar tissue. But nowadays, we have fiber optic cameras that are much more precise. So we don't have to take out a lot of the tissue. We don't strip the sinuses anymore. Uh, patients don't have bruising. Um, it's very hard to tell who's had sinus surgery when they leave the hospital, because we don't actually use packing in our practice. Um, our surgery is done endoscopically, which means using tiny cameras and fiber optic telescopes. So we don't pack, which is a, a very much a, a favorable thing for our patients. And it's just a different a technique. It's minimally invasive rather than going in and trying to scrape out the whole lining of the nose. And this is based on our new understanding about the way that the sinuses work and the, and the function of cilia. So surgery is really the third line treatment. So we really hope that all patients can benefit from medication and we can avoid surgery. But if patients fail what I would consider maximal therapy, then it's reasonable to think about surgery. And in fact, the results are, with surgery are very good. It's not that I can cure people. I don't tell patients that I can cure you be, uh, of your sinusitis because I'm not actually dealing with the inflammation. But I am dealing with structural problems that are contributing to the blockage and the ability for you to cope with the swelling in your nose. Uh, looking at larger series, we have a over 90% improvement uh, after five years. Now, that doesn't mean a cure, but that just means that the patient is better off where they were after five years having had their sinus surgery than before. And that's a pretty good batting average. Um, this is done outpatient, and again, no external incisions are necessary. So we have new cameras now and these uh, fine fiber optic telescopes I showed you a picture earlier that allow us to do all the surgery through the nostrils, actually. So this is a minimally invasive uh, technique uh, that has really revolutionized the way that we approach the sinuses surgically. So our, the goals of our surgery are to open those sinus drainage pathways to remove any kinds of polyps, again, to break that vicious cycle of obstruction, and a bonus is for our patients who have asthma, because there does seem to be a link between inflammation of the upper airway and inflammation of the lower airway. And when we can improve inflammation of the upper airway, uh, we see improvement in lower airway reactivity as well. So a lot of our asthmatics who seem to get triggers of their asthma because of chronic sinus infections seem to do better uh, by opening the sinuses, reducing the amount of discharge that's draining and possibly going into the lungs. And this is just a, a before and after showing you this is a, what a CAT scan looks like. And all of these gray areas of the thickening are where uh, the uh, sinuses are inflamed. And you can see here, this is actually the sphenoid sinus. And you can see the gray in here. And that's fluid that's built up in that sphenoid sinus because of blockage of that narrow opening of the sphenoid, which is about two millimeters wide. And then after surgery, what we've done is we've taken out the little individual cells in the ethmoid. And then now you can see this maxillary sinus here is open, and the sphenoid sinus has resolved its fluid as well. So I want to share with you a little bit of the newest technologies that we have uh, in endoscopic sinus surgery. And this is uh, a, a 
particularly valuable new technology that we have called surgical navigation. Surgical navigation is very much like uh, global positioning. So this is like having a GPS system uh, in your operating room when you're working on patients. And the way this works is that uh, you have a computer workstation in the operating room in addition to the cameras that we use for surgery. And this, this actually emits infrared light to little mirrored balls that will bounce that light back to a receiver. And what we have is a headset that's placed on the patient with little uh, mirrored balls. And then we have the instrument that's tracking that also has the mirrored balls. So there's a triangle there that, re the, that three-dimensional relationship is determined by the infrared light bouncing off those little balls. And that's how we can localize in space. And so what you see here is um, the patient fitted with this headset with these little mirrored balls. And then we get two displays. So we have our navigation workstation and then our surgical camera workstation. And this is the image that you get. So it's a very nice image. You can see there's three different views. So we have the view across the face, we have the side view, and then we have the view this way. And you can see the crosshairs here are localizing where we're pointing this probe into three-dimensional space, into the X, Y, and Z plane. So we are trying, in this particular case, we're trying to get to this gray area right here. And what this is showing us that crosshair is right on that spot. So with greater confidence, we can go into that area and know that we're not getting into the critical structures like the brain or the eye, which are obviously not areas that we want to be when we're doing our sinus surgery, but are potentially at risk with this kind of surgery. And one of the, the latest technologies that um, we've, has just recently been introduced, and we have begun using it here at Stanford, is the use of CAT scan and MRI scans together with navigation. And the reason this is significant is because CAT scans and MRI scans give, give us different information. CAT scans give us good bony detail, and MRIs give us good soft tissue detail. You can see some subtle differences here between the two. And what we can do is actually blend the two. So we can actually use MRI images and CAT scan images together in this navigation system. So we're really getting all kinds of different information, um, putting it all together and processed by a computer as we're doing our surgery. And this is just a, a little film here just to show you how the navigation actually works. And what we're doing here is we're loading up two different studies. We're loading up a CAT scan on this side, we're loading up an MRI on this side, and then you'll start to see this little red framework. And what that is is the computer is matching the MRI scan and the CAT scan and then blending them. And then what we can do is we can actually choose, look at the image, how it's changing, and look at we're sliding the bar back and forth. So we can choose how much of the image of a CAT scan we want and how much of an image of an MRI scan that we want. And what we're going to choose is somewhere in between so that we can see nice detail from the MRI, for example, in the brain area, but we see, also retain the bone detail of the sinuses. And now we're scrolling through this, doing our pre-surgical planning, and you can see how moving through these different areas, it gives us a lot of information by those three different planes. And then what you're going to see next is the actual use of it during the surgery. So in this corner, you'll see the surgical view. So you see that instrument's being passed through here. And you see how the crosshair is moving depending on where that probe is. So this is going to allow us to target the diseased tissue, and it's going to help us to keep out of the critical places that we don't want to be. And uh, so that's how we use uh, the CT navigation, again, with the possibility of an MRI uh, merge. And uh, just pushing the frontiers of endoscopic surgery even further, uh, this is now that we've really uh, developed good techniques for treating the sinuses, we can actually now even take it further beyond. And what I'm going to show you here is an unusual case, but it's an example of how these minimally invasive techniques can be useful to provide um, patients with an alternative to more drastic surgery. This is a case of a patient who had a little bit of brain actually fall through a bony defect in the floor of the brain. And since the brain and the sinuses are related to each other, if there's a hole there, the brain can drop through. This is called an encephalocele. And this right here is a bit of brain that has fallen below the floor of the brain, okay? Now, obviously, that's not a place where you want brain. You don't want brain in your nose uh, for a number of reasons. Um, if, you had a, if you did develop a sinus infection, you could actually get a meningitis or a brain infection. So this is something that would need to be fixed. Now, 15 or 20 years ago, if you had this problem, you would see the neurosurgeon, and they would probably do a craniotomy, which means opening the skull from the outside then lifting that up and taking that little 
bit of brain away and cutting it out. But because we have now minimally invasive techniques, we can actually approach this little piece of brain, this encephalocele, through the sinuses and do this without making any incisions on the outside at all. And this is just a view of the inside. This right here, this little lump, is this part of the brain. And so what we're going to do now is, by going through the sinuses, we're actually seeing where this piece of brain has fallen through. This is the hole in the floor of the uh, uh, brain uh, cavity. And you can see that this is normal brain, and then this is this abnormal brain that's kind of pushed through. And then what we can do is resect that from below, and we've taken care of this problem and saved the patient a significant brain operation. So we're expanding the realm of endoscopic surgery to the skull base, and this is a very exciting area of development in our field because now we can help patients not just with sinus problems, but potentially with uh, neurosurgical problems and other serious uh, problems associated with that area. Lastly, I just want to tell you a little bit about the research that's going on at our facility. So I'm the director of the Stanford Sinus Center, and we're a dedicated um, center for the evaluation, uh, clinical evaluation and research in the area of sinusitis. And uh, one of my main areas of interest is the role of vitamin A in the healing of sinuses. Um, we're also looking at trying to improve the nebulizer therapies. I told you that the nebulizers right now don't seem to be delivering medications to the right place. And so we're trying to develop new nebulizers that will actually get the particles into the nose. And then we're also looking at long-term clinical outcomes of sinus surgery. We're participating in the first NIH-sponsored uh, clinical trial looking at how patients do after sinus surgery. I want to just show you a little bit. We've been talking about cilia throughout this talk, and I just wanted to show you some of the areas that uh, we're studying. This is actually a rabbit uh, sinus biopsy, and the rabbit is actually the best model for uh, studying the sinuses. Um, this is normal, and what you see here looks like carpet or looks like, like, broom, uh, uh, like little brushes on a broom. Uh, these individual little uh, filaments are cilia. And so the cilia, actually, if you were to see a movie of it, they would be sweeping back and forth, and they'd be pushing the, the mucus along. So this is sort of a low power view and then a high power view. And you see how nicely aligned they are, and it almost looks like a lush carpet, and that's normal. Now, I was telling you that in the old days, we used to strip out the lining of the sinus, and all we would get back is scar tissue. And this confirms that. This is what the lining of the nose would look like if you just scraped it out and let it heal in. Um, no cilia at all. And here, some cilia, but it looks more like spaghetti. It just looks like a few, you know, random cilia. And this is not going to beat in that really nice organized fashion to push the mucus out. And this is probably why a lot of patients didn't do very well with the older style of sinus surgery. So what we have found is when you apply a topical vitamin A or retinoic acid into a healing sinus, you can actually induce normal cilia to generate. And the next slide shows this uh, re restoration of the cilia. So we do the same surgery where we scrape out the lining, even though we know that's not the best for the rabbit, but we put vitamin A there in addition to just taking out the lining. And this is what happens. You get nice restored cilia. Now, this isn't perfectly normal, but these look a lot better than what you had before with just scar tissue. And so just to kind of review again, normal looks like this. <clears throat> no treatment looks like that, no cilia at all. And then vitamin A looks pretty good. It looks pretty close to normal. So this is an area that's very interesting to us because we really don't understand how uh, wound healing occurs in the sinuses, and we're going to take this further with additional studies, hopefully taking it to human trials at, at some point. So the future of sinus research is in multiple areas. Um, one is to understand better the science of inflammation, and I've, hopefully I've shown you the importance of understanding inflammation as a cause of chronic sinusitis. Um, I think we're going to also be seeing much better um, uh, focus in terms of genetic studies. So finding genes that are associated with sinusitis and hopefully developing gene therapies. And then also looking at new ways to deliver drugs and innovative new drugs for the treatment of sinusitis. And finally, new technologies that are going to improve our ability to do surgery. Uh, we have the navigation now. People are starting to look at robotics. There are many areas uh, in uh, the field of uh, sinus, sinus and sinus surgery uh, that remain to be discovered. 
and uh, hopefully have a taste for that now. So there is hope, and we're looking for cures day by day. Thank you all very much for your attention. The question is, uh, nebulizers, how, do you, how is it actually delivered and how, how do you actually get a cloud of, of saline? You always have to buy a machine for those. There are a number of different ones that are available on the market. They look like humidifiers, you know, so it's almost like that except they have a little nose piece that you can put up to your nose. And um, we have found, just in terms of our patients, that an irrigation using a larger volume of saline is just as beneficial and it's a lot easier. It's not as expensive. You can just mix up salt and soda solution. And if you flush the nose out, the idea is just to get more moisture into the nose because moisture is actually beneficial for the ciliary clearance. And that has definitely been shown that cilia actually work better in a moist environment. So moisture is key depend no matter how you want to deliver it. Um, but nebulizers do help in that way. The question is, is adding an antibiotic to that nebulizer going to actually be additionally helpful? And we don't know that yet. When you use a topical nasal steroid, is it actually getting into the sinuses? And that's a good question, into the maxillary sinuses. So just as the nebulizers don't quite get into the sinuses as we'd like, uh, topical steroids actually can't get into there either. But topical steroids will get to the area adjacent to the uh, sinus outflow. So the idea is that you're controlling, you can't actually get it into the sinus, but you can possibly reduce swelling at the gateway. So that small opening, that ostium, if you can reduce swelling there, then perhaps you can allow that maxillary sinus to, to regain function. So the question is, do, does loss of sense of smell and taste ever come back? Um, it really is highly variable. So first of all, just as you mentioned, the loss of taste is associated with loss of sense of smell. And it's very interesting when they looked at these studies, if you look at 100 patients who come in primarily with a complaint of loss of taste, 90% uh, of those patients are actually going to have um, loss of sense of smell as their primary problem because taste and smell are so closely associated. In terms of whether it comes back or not, that's a very difficult question. And we see a very wide range of patients with very severe illnesses and then mild. And, uh, you know, it really depends on whether we see swelling up in that high area near the olfactory nerves or whether there's an opening there and there's no polyps and no masses there. I would say someone who had some swelling but, not, but a clear olfactory area would have a higher chance of getting recovery of that than someone who had a densely filled nose with all kinds of polyps. Because even if you control the inflammation a little bit, those particles are never going to really reach the nose. Now, there can be irreversible changes. Unfortunately, some patients who do have surgery get scarring in that area, and that would be a reverse, an irreversible loss of sense of smell. Um, it really depends on the individual patient, but not all loss of sense of smell is permanent. Is there a clear different, a distinction between allergy and sensitivity? That's a very good question, and I would say yes. So allergy has very strict criteria by which we would make a diagnosis. You need to inject a small amount of the material under the skin and see a reaction, a little uh, hive or a little wheel. If you don't have that, then you, you don't have allergy. But Many of my patients who have negative allergy testing can identify many things that cause swelling. Uh, for example, red wine and beer. Some people have a lot of nasal swelling because of that. And it's not necessarily that they're allergic to those, but they have sensitivities to that. And so um, there is a difference there. And sensitivity uh, means that it's not a strictly allergic process, but it is actually causing inflammation. So that's another you know, indication of, again, those non-allergic pathways of inflammation that I'm talking about. Sensitivity is probably the best way to describe those, but we don't necessarily understand the mechanisms. Can saline actually open the sinuses? Saline itself uh, potentially can indirectly open the sinuses by clearing out mucus and obstructed uh, secretions in the area of the sinuses, but uh, it's an indirect effect. So it, it doesn't actually, again, doesn't actually penetrate into that opening and actually clean out that opening but it cleans out the things that flow by that opening, and it reduces the number of inflammatory triggers, perhaps, that are causing the obstruction of that sinus. So, so it is helpful in that way. Uh, and in terms of your second question, um, if you looked at sort of all comers who had dental problems and sinus problems, or at least presented with dental pain, um, it's probably gonna break down about 50-50. There are some very unusual dental problems that actually cause sinus 
uh, infections, but the majority is sinus problems that actually cause dental symptoms. So, so it's, it's unusual for the dent, dental infection to go the other way. What's the role of, of antibiotics in, this, in the irrigation? And we talked a little bit about that, and, uh, about topical therapies. Um, they do have uh, some role, um, but you're not delivering directly into the sinuses unless you've had surgery. And um, there are also concerns because potentially you could develop resistance um, by using them uh, too much. It's, um, it's a nice alternative because the side effect profile is better, um, but the role is still being defined. It's a little bit difficult for me to say from my practice because I tend to collect all the patients who don't do well. But I would say that uh, my expectation would be that the majority of patients who have chronic sinus problems would do well with medical therapy. And if you notice in my, the way that I showed you the different tiers of treatment, that surgery was the third line. And that's because I'm expecting the minority of patients to actually require surgery. Now, they all gather in my office because they've gone through all those medical therapies, but there's probably many, many more patients that I never see that receive that kind of treatment that actually do well. Now, they may need that treatment twice a year or maybe even three times a year, okay, because chronic sinusitis is a chronic illness. Um, but if they can manage with that, that's not bad, and that's better than having surgery. But when it starts to take over your life and you have symptoms every day and you only have a partial response to those very extensive courses of therapy, that's when it's time to think about doing some kind of a surgical intervention. So the question is, if you have mild uh, chronic sinusitis, is there a risk of permanent damage? And I would say, based on my understanding, that there probably is not. Um, we have some patients who make, are made, uh, the di where the diagnosis is made in, in maybe in their 70s, and doctors have just kept brushing them off, but they've actually had sinus problems for 50 years, and no one ever stopped to pay attention or to get a CAT scan or to try to treat them, and then they eventually need surgery, and we see beautiful restoration of sinus function in those patients. So based on pa uh, patients like that, I would say that you know, even if you have a mild case for a long, long period of time, your cilia, although they may not be working as well as they could, have the potential to recover, um, and so it's, I would not consider it permanent damage. There's only one study uh, that did a head-to-head -head comparison, and that study is one that I had cited there, where if you use an oral antibiotic, um, you're gonna get six weeks of relief average for the most severe, severe patients, and with the nebulized, you're gonna get 17 weeks of relief. Okay, so it is double, but if you think about it, it's actually only 11 weeks more. It's, it's not huge. And in that study, they showed that um, when you use, expose yourself to the nebulized antibiotics, you actually induce more rapid changes in the types of bacteria that you're isolating. So that's potentially a concern in terms of resistance because it means that the body is, that the bacteria are sort of outwitting uh, the antibiotic that's being delivered and are continually changing. So there's plus and minus to that. There's a whole wide range of different antibiotics that can be adapted to topical form. In our practice, we try to understand what the bacteria is before we choose the antibiotic. And uh, what we would do is culture to try to find the organism, and then we can do a study to say what antibiotics kill that organism. And then we say, okay, what antibiotic can we put into solution that matches that profile? So a lot of antibiotics are adaptable, but not all of them are necessarily beneficial. Well, there's uh, a number of different types of irrigation. And um, the one that I recommend to my patients is called the NeoMed kit. And I don't have any financial interest in it at all, um, but it's the, it's the kit that we actually provide to our patients after surgery, and it's available over the counter. It's just a squeeze bottle. It's, it's very simple technology. There's also um, neti pots, which some people use as a passive irrigation, but I like the squeeze bottle because it adds a little bit more of a force. Um, it's very, but it's gentle. At the same time, you can wash it in your dishwasher. There's no hard and fast rules as far as irrigation. It's sort of just what, fe what feels right.